Hello again. Uh, my name is Bonnie Adderstrong, and I'm the Assistant Events Director here at Booksmith. Uh, today, it is, of course, my pleasure to host Jim Ottaviani and Gerald Dye to celebrate the release of Einstein. Um, before I introduce them, I have a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, copies of Einstein will be available for sale at that back counter that you saw coming in. And if you pre-ordered a book, you can pick it up there as well. Um, secondly, please keep your phones off or on silent for the duration of the presentation. Um, as you saw me fiddling earlier, um, this event is being live streamed. Our audience is not visible on the live stream, but if you don't want to be live on YouTube, just avoid walking in front of it and you'll be okay. Um, and finally, we will have a Q&A at the end of the event, so hold your questions until then, but definitely have them ready to go. Um, and now for the fun part. Uh, Jim Ottaviani has written 15 graphic novels about scientists. His books include Naturalist with E.O. Wilson, Astronauts, Women on the Fl Final Frontier, which you can check out on the back counter. We have a few copies. Um, Hawking, The Imitation Game, Primates, and Feniman. Is that how you say his name? Feynman. Feynman. Yeah. Um, his books are New York Times bestsellers and have been translated into a dozen languages. And they've received praise from publications ranging from Nature and Physics World to Entertainment Weekly and Variety. He publishes much, as, much of his work through his own company, GT Labs, uh, whose name is a nod to the lab in which Peter Parker got bit by the famous radioactive <laughs> spider. Um, he's worked with dozens of illustrators to craft compelling graphic biographies of scientists, tales of science history, and explorations of scientific discoveries in various fields. Um, he lives in Michigan and comes to comics via careers in both nuclear engineering and librarianship. He got his master's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan, um, went on to study, take some library courses at Drexel, and then later earned his MS in information and library studies, also from the University of Michigan. Now he works at the university library as coordinator of Deep Blue, the university's institutional repository. And of course, Gerald Dye has been creating art and comics in the Boston area since 2005. He's produced self-published mini-comics and comic stories for anthologies like Inbound, Minimum Page, Hellbound, and the award-winning um, Little Nemo, Windsor McKay tribute, Dream Another Dream. In 2012, he received the Mice Comics grant for his mini-comic From the Crowd, From the Clouds, excuse me. His first graphic novel, Pigs Might Fly, was released in 2017. You can find his art in children's books, comics, animations, and exhibits throughout New England. And you can also find his work through a quick Google search, which if you haven't seen his illustrations, I really recommend. Um, they're really stunning and worth perusing. Uh, his work stems from an interest in science and technology, though it frequently contains a healthy dose of wonder. He received his BFA from UMass Dartmouth in painting and his MFA at MassArt in the studio for interrelated media. Gerald's been teaching courses in drawing, cartooning, and comics to adults in Massachusetts since 2010 and he is also a freelance designer. He lives nearby in JP, so that basically makes him our neighbor. Um, so it's good to have you, neighbor. Um, and to tell you all a little bit about the book, Einstein is a book about a man who you might have heard of. Um, his name is literally a synonym for genius. And yet for all his fame and scientific discoveries, there's a great deal about this complex man that the world doesn't often include in the stories they tell about him. This book honors that complexity by providing readers with an intimate look at the Albert Einstein beyond the legend with the crazy hairstyle and the unprecedented scientific discoveries. It's the story of a scientist who made many mistakes and even when he wanted to be proven wrong was often right in the end. It's the story of a humanist who struggled to connect with people and it's the story of a reluctant revolutionary who paid a high price for living with a single dream. I for one am so excited to hear them talk about it. Everyone, please welcome Jim and Gerald. Thank you, Bonnie. Oh, maybe I should. You said I have to get closer to the mic. Is that better? Great. So I'll say thank you again to Bonnie, this time into the mic. And Gerald and I had, had written a note at the top of our, our notes, like, do a brief intro to us. <laughs> Done. We don't have to do that. Um, so let's get right to it. In this 
brief introduction to the book. We're going to talk. We're going to expand on uh, what we're going to expand on what Bonnie just said about you know, genius, wanted to be wrong, right, right, right in the end anyway, uh, paid a high price. Uh, and we're also going to spoil the ending a little bit, but in the most ambiguous <laughs> way possible. Uh, not the ending that you know. We, we all know that Einstein isn't in fact with us any longer. You know what? I'm going to slide this just a little bit over so that I can see people rather than the columns. <laughs> Gerald probably wouldn't have this problem because he's way taller than me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let's start at the beginning and how this book came to be. Uh, like Feynman and Hawking before him, I wasn't in a hurry to write about Einstein myself. Uh, and I had a whole bunch of, I, I used to call them arguments, it's probably excuses. Um, the first one was, I am not ready, to which our publisher said, you said that about Feynman, and you said that about Hawking. So, forget it. Uh, then I said, no, well, also he's too big. And if you, wonder, if you spend like 10 seconds wandering around uh, Booksmith, you'll find mon much more than a handful of books that have Einstein in the title and or are about Einstein himself. Uh, but the same is true of Feynman and Hawking as well. So another excuse, which I think is a check, I should have just like struck lines through this rather than doing the check because it doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't work. The last one might be the most valid. And when I say too difficult, I'm not necessarily talking about it being Einstein being too difficult in terms of the physics, although I needed a ton of help uh, with the physics, and Gerald suffered through some of that ton of help stuff. Uh, again, not to give too much away, uh, but we had to rebuild this airplane while it was up in the air a couple times uh, be because of some of the things like, you know, you, you write a script, you have this great idea about what something should look like and something should be, and then you see it, and uh, Gerald made the horrible mistake many times of drawing exactly what I asked for. <laughs> and it's like, that's not quite right. And I, get, I kept having that sinking feeling of that's not quite right. And uh, went back to a physics consultant who helped me uh, get it right, but that, mean, that meant some redrawing. So there's that aspect of the too difficult. But I think the other one that I already knew from, you know, just Einstein appearing in all the other books that I ever, I'd ever written, not all of them, uh, but many, is that he's a difficult person as well. Difficult person as well. Let me change the emphasis there. Um, genius, yes. Write about physics almost always, uh, even even when he would propose stuff about quantum mechanics and say, here's why quantum mechanics is dumb and stupid, because it implies this, and that can't be true. Sorry, uh, Albert, it turns out that it's true. There was just a Nobel Prize awarded this year uh, about one of the things he hated uh, about quantum mechanics, and then that he had put up as an example of something that couldn't possibly be right, and it was. And nobody had thought of it before except for him. Uh, write about politics. He got out of uh, Nazifying Germany way before others did. Uh, he was right about uh, the, the worries and uh, problems of uh, atomic uh, power and uh, atomic weaponry. He was good on civil rights. What he wasn't so great of, with is people themselves. Humanity got it nailed. Specifically, people. I don't know. And so I was worried that it was going to be tough to talk about him because it's hard to admire his relationships with individuals who he supposedly loved and su supposedly loved and definitely loved him. But we'll get a little bit to that. Um, and that made me one of the reasons why this story is the way, he, way it is. And I say story on purpose. It's not, I, I'm starting to shy away, and we're right here at the biography and memoir section, right? Uh, I'm starting to shy away from calling things biography, at least the stuff that I do. Uh, it, and it's not that the, everything isn't true, but I don't want to claim, based on what we've done, 
that this is the be all and end all of biography. And uh, a lot of his colleagues would agree, I think, with that. Uh, I don't want to imply that the dialogue isn't real. Most of it is taken from letters and conversations and, uh, and quotes from, from peers, uh, or lightly paraphrased from things that he actually said. Uh, but, there are some, but we do have to manufacture some scenes, we have to manufacture some stuff, and there is one particular scene in the book that is very explicitly manufactured. Uh, I totally made up this thing, but at the same time, it comes from a real thing he said, and a real situation he found himself in. Uh, Gerald and I just stitched them together in an unusual and, I hope, obviously, a historical way. Uh, I think you'll know it when you see it. Uh, further, it's not a traditional biography in that the, the focus on, focuses on the interior life he leads to the exclusion of almost everything else. And in this, I don't feel any of the qualms that I might be like projecting here. Uh, and, and that's because of Einstein's own autobiographical notes. He, did, he was persuaded to do, some, some people are nodding and, and may know, know of this. Oh, you're just nodding. Uh, well, I'll, I will tell you. He was persuaded to do autobiographical notes uh, sometime when he was around in his 60s. Uh, he writes 90 pages. In those 90 pages, he is, he spends maybe five pages on his childhood, and the rest is all about physics. In those 90 pages, he has one father, no, no mother, apparently, two teachers, nobody else, and a roughly 12 predecessors, only one of whom he addresses as anything more than a name on an equation, and it's Sir Isaac there. As far as friends and family, wives, kids, colleagues, even Niels Bohr, my favorite physicist of all time, not present in his autobiographical notes. So what, we've, what, so what we tried to do is bring their perspective on Einstein into the book. Um, and at the same time show why, show that Einstein really cared mostly about physics. He lived it, breathed it, thought about it constantly. Uh, so one of the challenges of the book was, was to get that across. We, we always try to show readers what it was like to be the main character. Sometimes that means taking some poetic license, which, which I've already described. But Einstein's poetic license in telling his own story, I think, gave us, I hope, gave us permission to be sort of selective uh, on how we told that story. Uh, at the same time, we don't get to know a lot of the other people through their thoughts. In fact, we ex very explicitly chose to have those folks only talk to us, only act, and we don't get inside their head. It's all outward looking in on Einstein. But I think as a result, they do reveal more about Einstein yeah. than he publicly it's the, it's the revealed people, about himself. It's the people in his life who are narrating the book for yep. us. Yeah hand the narrator off from one person to the next, to the next yeah. as we go through his life. Yeah. So this, this is their story, not really a biography, uh, as much as his. Want to talk about how we made it? Sure. Let's talk about it. how we made it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to um, talk comics a bit here. So uh, I'm going to... Yeah, fine, sure. I'll I'm punch sure. a little bit. Um, yeah, so um, I wanted to show a little bit about the process of making comics in general, talk about the process that we used in this particular comic. And so the first step in any comics process is taking Jim's script and turning it into a series of thumbnails, um, which are, if you haven't heard the term before, they're very loose drawings maybe a step up from stick figures, although I have seen lots of uh, cartoonists who use stick figures in this phase, um, but very loose, just trying to get a sense of flow, like can you move through the panels, 
can you get a sense of what's going on more or less? Are the panels interesting next to each other? Is there um, interesting, um, yeah, can you just follow and flow through it? In this book, and we'll talk about it more, there were some specific challenges. One is that we use uh, panel gutters in a specific way. We'll talk more about that, but I wanted to in kind of indicate that. I don't know if you can see it here with some yellow lines to describe gutters. Um, I also have put up um, the two pages at once, which we call a comic spread. Um, and I always like to do that when I'm planning my comics because that gives a, a better sense of how the reader will turn the page and see what's happening. Because you kind of have this little tiny glimpses of the future when you turn into on a, on a new comics page because you can see. So if you put something you know, exciting and thrilling in the bottom right corner of a, of a panel that can kind of spoil, spoiler effects, so it's good to have all that kind of stuff planned out um, ahead of time. You'll also see maybe a few of my little notes here and there. There's a, a new version of Einstein's head over there. Some notes about color. I talked about this theater, this shot in the theater being red. Um, so stuff like that uh, will appear in that process. Um, and of course, I'd hand these off to Jim and our editors. And I don't know if you guys could actually read them or <laughs> understand them or just get a, enough of a sense. Oh, it's more than enough of a sense, yeah. in part because we already know the story. Yes. Uh, and these thumb thumbnails, relatively speaking, are pretty tight. Part of that is because Einstein is so icon iconographic. It's like, you don't need a lot of lines yeah. if, you're, if you're working with a good cartoonist right. to know that it's Einstein there. Very true. Yeah. Um, and then this is going to be impossible to see <laughs> because we've got a lot of light here. But I do, I work uh, my pencil stage. So this is what I'm uh, first drafting, a more finished look of the thing. Um, I work digitally, uh, which allows me a ton of flexibility in terms of my panel layout, um, where text goes. So this is a big challenge when you're writing comics. You've got to make sure you leave enough room for the words and you can read the pictures and things aren't covering things up because it ends up being a lot of work. If you get that wrong, you have to go back and either redraw things or lose something that you drew that you really fell in love with because the, the words have to be there. So I learned that working digitally works really well. And right here I'm working with a very faint blue pencil. It's called non-photo blue. And it's there to disappear when it, it gets ink. And I have a, a refined version here. There we go. Um, which you can see a little bit better. Um, yeah, so this is more, this is done to also hand off to get the approval of um, Jim and the editor, uh, making sure that, the, yes, the comic does read, we can follow things uh, from point A to point B, it looks good. You know, this is the, kind of the last big chance to make big changes. Mm -hmm. So if I need to you know, zoom in, or we need to get a character that wasn't seen in the panel, we could do that. Um, yeah, and this is where like so much of the, the final decisions and big decisions are made. So I think one of the harder stages in, in making comics is, is committing to the pencils because it's still there's still a little bit of nebulousness. There's still a bit of um, things you can do. And then once I've finished that, I literally print this out onto a sheet of 11 by 17 paper and I ink it. And I actually brought with me oh, some examples. Uh, how that looks. So this is our our spread. Um, yeah. So I draw that uh, in ink. Um, so, but, but also at this at that at that pencil stage is usually where uh, I would want to take one last crack yes. at the at the words too, because now it's really real, and this is where oftentimes it happens like. All right. The picture tells, the picture says the whole thing that I need, that we wanted said here. So let's get rid of some words. Um, I don't always succeed in that, uh, but more well, often than enough, not, yeah. that's that's what's going on. It's like yeah. ah, yeah. kind of pare down, get things simpler. Um, after it's drawn, I, we then put in the word balloons, uh, which are done digitally, and they're done digitally so that they can be changed. So we can stay flexible, so we can get foreign editions if we need uh, other languages to replace that text. Um, and it's easy to change the balloons and move them around and get, get everything looking um, good compositionally, both within the panel and within the page as a whole. Um, for this book, I, I drew it almost entirely with a, um, 
a zebra brush pen, which is a kind of a new style of pen. New is like 15 years old, 12, 15 years old, but fairly new in, in the scope of you know drawing and art, um, which allowed me a kind of looseness of line, but also has the ability to go very very thin, um, which I really enjoy. I enjoy this kind of um, a dancing line sort of thing that I go for that it has life to it. Um, yeah, so almost exclusively that, a little bit of um, fill brush for black areas, and I will talk a little bit more about some stylistic choices that happened later on in the book, where I had to, to change that a little bit for the, for the purposes of the storytelling. Um, and of course, the last stage is the color. So the color was done by um, Allison Acton. Twice. Twice. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> Um, so I can't talk too much about that, but it does, you know, it takes a line drawing and it makes it pop. It almost um, immediately, um, it looks more finished. Um, we worked a little bit, we did a little bit of discussion when figuring out the colors. One of the things that I wanted to avoid was a sort of like history is sepia tone thing, which you see from time to time. And it, it works to some, to some degree, but I really wanted to put a reader kind of in these moments and to feel like the, that this is how the world looked if you were there rather than how the world looks to us now because media degrades and it's sepia tone. Um, for reference, we, I mostly was looking at um, a lot of realist painters from the era. So, um, and it, these are all people that I, that I didn't know anything about before I did the book. Um, but there, there was a big movement of realist painters in the uh, late um, 19th, early 20th century. Mm, excuse me. People like, I'm going to probably butcher some of these names, but uh, Marcel Ryder, Eric Ludwig Hennison, um, Nielsa, Nielsa Olslo, uh, Paul Fisher, Peter Wilhelm, um, and a bunch of others. Um, but it was a really great source. It was a great source for me for reference. Um, one of the things that's hard to find are photos of the interiors of spaces. People didn't take pictures of the inside of their houses. It wasn't a thing that you would do. Why would you do that? It's also it's what really, did their food look like? <laughs> right. There's not a lot of photos of that. But painters, painters are like, ah, daily life. That's interesting. I want to paint a picture of that. So that was the source for so much of the of the visual inspiration for the book. Um, yeah, it was really really valuable. In addition to the sort of this very specific historic thing that you need to set where things happen, and they need to look, know what those buildings look like, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, let's keep going here. Oh, yeah, and, 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 it's, yeah. <laughs> and I think at that point, Allison does the equivalent of, you know, those painter's palettes, the, the big uh, egg-shaped, egg, uh, cloud-shaped things. She basically created a digital version of that and shared it with both of us. And you can see how I dress. Uh, there's really no point in sharing color <laughs> choices with me. So it was basically, Gerald, what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and she nailed it. I mean, she nailed it. I think yeah. the, the color palette that she used throughout the book just feels right. It just feels good and timely, but not antique which is what right. I wanted. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's one page. Uh, do that 250 plus more times, and you got a book. It's really easy. 284, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> No, it wasn't. <laughs> couldn't have been that long. Couldn't have been that long. Uh, but yeah, that, that's my segue. And like I said, I'm bad at segues. Uh, but fortunately, comics are really good at them. In fact, that's the whole point of comics, right? It's panel to panel transitions, uh, and you get a you get multiple segues on every single page, and that kind of leads us to some of the things I hope uh, that we again you are special friends in the audience, uh, have, have, a, have, have an inside look at why we did some of the things we did beyond just making this a comic book. Um, and so there's a really famous book about comics called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. He breaks down panel transitions, uh, and it turns out Joe and I both agree on this. Like, he's got too many categories. <laughs> there aren't quite that many categories, really, Scott. Sorry. Uh, but, mo but these are the main ones that he specifies. But most of the things that you see in comics are really these moment to moment, which I think consider the same as what he would call action to action, but he's, he separates those out. Uh, and that's most of what you see in comics. And that's one of the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why Einstein is kind of perfect in comics, because 
the big thing about Einstein is his melding, his theories melding space and time in ways that nobody had thought of prior to his discoveries. And, and melding space and time, it just happens over and over and over and over in comics. It, you can't escape it. Uh, every page will have at least one of these conflations visually of space meaning a passage of time. And that's something that we decided to explicitly play with because we kind of treated the arrow of time in this book as an option to choose, but not always the thing that we're going to do. So we don't always move from past to present. Sometimes we move from present to past. And that's one of the things that we're showing here. And as you saw in Gerald's uh, pencils, uh, where he had marked a different transition, a gap between the panels means something different than when there's really no gap between the pictures at all. It means, it means a leap in time, one way or, or the other. So, fun to do with Einstein and important. Now, having set that rule, Gerald decided... We have to break that rule from time to time. <laughs> Um, specifically in moments where it got really actually fairly nebulous, where we're, we're, we're not saying one thing happened before another, we're saying, oh, he, in, in this case, he's working on his big idea and time is passing. So this is our way of talking about like a montage sequence. So, you know, things are happening out of order, this can be read in any order. I mean, there's more or less a, a direct line in, ter in terms of how you read it, but it's not absolutely critical. And we wanted to use that breaking and those, the, the effect of when you're looking at, at a book page after page, it's fairly regular. We use mostly a six panel grid um, for the comedy that when you hit a page like this, guess what? It jumps out, you know, it pops for you. It makes you say, oh, this is, this is important. Something's going on here. Um, so yeah, so that's what this kind of, this sort of page is about. Um, we're also using color in, a, in an interesting mm -hmm. way here too. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the, the palette being fairly, you know, of its era. And then we use this blue to kind of indicate to the viewer a science idea. <laughs> this is blueprint blue. So he has this violin he tinkers on, which represents his big theory of general relativity, um, which he's working on forever. And it always shows up as this, this blue. And whenever he's thinking deep thoughts, his head is literally in a cloud of blue. Um, yeah. Do we, have more, do we have more heads in the cloud? No, we don't have more heads in the cloud. I was a little bummed. Did you want me to go back? No, 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 you're good. you're good. I was a little bummed, actually, as we were setting up that the, the resolution couldn't be right, but maybe it's okay <laughs> that you're just seeing, getting the gestalt of the pages uh -huh. rather than focusing in on the details. Okay. And it is readable, I hope. Everybody able to see? Yeah, good. Uh, another thing that we did uh, is mess around with how we tell the overstory of this. My initial big theory was there would be no captions and no thoughts other than Einstein's in this book. And then we get about halfway through, and even I'm going, wait, is that Marcel Grossman or Michel Besso here? I mean, they're, they're both Swiss guys with mustaches and dark curly hair. It was very hard to do character designs for all these men who basically dress the same. <laughs> yeah, right, it's off. That's a good point, I never thought. Uh, I, I ran into this with uh, astronauts' books as well, especially, especially the, the first book I did about the Apollo era, era where every, every single person wears short sleeve, uh, pocket protector, bandlon shirt, crew cut, white guy. And it's like, that is the most visually boring look possible. And this is slightly different visually boring because... But again, because mustaches, they, cause mustaches. <laughs> they all had a wide variety. Yeah, it's a little bit better. But yeah. I mean, there's even less variety in the clothing. Yeah. yeah. Then. So anyway, we ended up needing captions. Bummer. But then we thought, you know, there might be a thing that we can do with the captions that will help. Oh, that happened automatically. So typically in comics, when people are talking, the balloons are balloony. They're in, you know, oval shape. Uh, but as, a, as the previous slide mentioned, we decided to have, and as we talked about before, 
we decided to have other people tell Einstein's story. And so when you have this narration from outside the book, you know, the voiceover in movies, uh, the visual indicator for that in comics is a squared off box, typically. You know, meanwhile, well, we're going to have people talk to the readers. Let's give them captiony word balloons instead. And then that also gives us permission then to give, to, to put word actual captions, captions, actual captions, <laughs> actual captions. Uh, in the book. Yeah. Uh, it, it saved a lot of, there was some moments every now and then where you'd have a character talking to another character and get uh, a balloon, uh, and then would also talk to the reader, and it was like, oh, they're going to be, the readers are going to be confused. What are, who are they talking to in this case? So right. this was a solution to make that possible, that you could instantly, once you know, oh, this is, this is narration, that, and this is them talking to another person. Yeah. yeah. Again, I hope I'm not giving away too many of the secrets in front of the book. All of this happens within the first three pages. Uh, you'll, you'll see these things. Um, and finally, I think we already talked about this. One of the beauties of comics is that it can get inside people's heads in ways that other media have a tough time. Certainly in, I would say, in film and in uh, plays, People have to tell you what they're thinking, and uh, they tell it in their usual voice, and it's sometimes difficult. I mean, Shakespeare does this all the time. Shakespeare needed comics. <laughs> uh, but we are working in a visual medium on the printed page, so we can get away with some of this. And, and what Gerald and Allison did, but it, it's, I mean, it's Gerald's art direction with this, I think is, is I'm biased. It's really beautiful. Uh, and we have so many ways of showing Einstein being there and not being there, thinking about physics. And there's a lot of equations. There are a lot of equations in this book. Don't worry. They're, they're there as set dressing. You, you call it something else. Texture. I call it texture. 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 That's yeah. a better word than set dressing. Um, and they're just, it's sort of like, here be science. Just, just know that he's thinking deeper thoughts than you or I would be thinking in this situation, and maybe different thoughts than you and I should would be thinking in this situation. And oftentimes, especially in his interactions with other people, things that he should probably not be thinking of, the, here, again, giving away a, a yeah. panel, Papa, 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 and Einstein just ain't there. Uh, And then the last big thing is, and Gerald already alluded to it. Why don't, why don't you go with this? Oh, one? sure. So, um, well, this was this was one of your um, things with this is to talk about Einstein, to talk about Einstein in terms of his fame, and talk about what happens to somebody who's becoming as famous as Einstein um, became. Oh, but before, all right. So, yes. So we we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to come up with some visual way to indicate that. Um, so here we have sort of two uh, extremes of cartooning style. Again, it's hard to see. This is a, a Prince Valiant comic, and this one I, what, what's that's called the sack. Called the sack. Called the sack by Richard Thompson. Yeah. Um, so kind of two extremes. Realistically rendered. It's a complex scene where all, all the poses are beautiful. Um, maybe I shouldn't put that right up next to my drawing, but that's fine. <laughs> um, and then the other extreme is is super cartoony and um, symbolic as as opposed to representational. Um, so it was Jim's idea to take that to take that and use it to talk about how, as Einstein became iconic. So cartoons are iconic. Um, so there's actually a change in how we drew him over time throughout the book. Don't so, say we. You did it. Well, <laughs> on how I drew. I mean, it's really, really Jim's kind. <laughs> um, so yeah. So here we have a representation of him in, from the beginning of the book um, with his wife. This was actually like a one of those flash forward moments. So I was drawing it in this style, talking about the future. Um, and then as it progresses, as he becomes world famous to the degree that no scientist has it, had ever become in their lifetime, um, he gets cartoonier and cartoonier and cartoonier, and maybe a little bit more distant and detached from the people around, even, even though he kind of always, always detached from the people around him. Um, and this is where I actually switch, I switch tools. I was using a very thin, Kind of brush pen, I end up using a thicker one to get those thicker, chunkier lines. And then we also use color to use a, a more sort of 
bright, classic, cartoony color um, in his sweater and outfit, which he never changes. You know, he changes jackets a few times uh, in the early part of the book, but because he's a cartoon character, he wears one thing in every single uh, moment. Um, yeah, and I, I, are we there? We're close. We're close. Are we yeah, so... Why don't you take over again? Okay. Or you can just, yeah. I can yell from this, this microphone. So... I hope this kind of sort of can be, I have to move this back down there. I hope that this kind of sort of convinces you of what we've convinced ourselves of anyway that Einstein is in fact perfect for comics. Um, and that comics, even though it kind of has this lowbrow reputation and it's for little kids and it's for simple stuff and it's uh, and when it's not really simple for little kids, then it's for the arrested adolescents among us, and I still have some of that in me, uh, you know, who, who like seeing people in skin-tight clothes hit each other. <laughs> uh, but this quote, I think, works on a number of levels talking about comics, because even though it is, in fact, a simple form, uh, it's words and pictures put together, and it has been used simply there are a lot of things you can do with it. And we thought it was perfect for uh, talking about maybe the single most influential scientist of all time. Except there have been, I mean, there have been others, right? So that's actually a Charles Darwin. That's the last line from uh, Origin of Species. People, yeah, people are already know this, this is too good and fun, too smart of an audience. You saw, you saw it coming. Uh, so, yeah, Einstein did not, in fact, say that. Uh, but, as Bonnie said at the very beginning, his, his name has become synonymous with genius in ways that Darwin has not. Uh, Jane Goodall's a genius, but we don't use her name this way either. I mean, there's, there are many people who can do this, but uh, when, when, you not, when you spill your milk at the dinner table... Nobody says, way to go, Goodall. <laughs> uh, they, in fact, say, way to go, Einstein. Um, and we think he has a great story. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. I'm not going to say this, and I'm not going to end this. Oh, the, that last slide did get here. Yeah. Cool. Got to go. Are there any questions? Uh, we have time for some Q and A. I think so. We just hang out. And... Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Uh, for Jim, uh, I know you've you've done a number of history of science comics. Yes. In different forms, uh, Einstein and some of the most recent ones have been biographical, looking at one scientist. Can you talk right. about the strengths and limits of that approach, as opposed to like what you did with the dinosaurs or uh, a group of scientists or a scientific movement? Uh, this is going to sound crass and commercial, but I think some of the strengths and weaknesses are, in part at least, publisher-driven. Uh, ensembles, uh, from what I understand, are a little bit harder to pitch uh, and promote. It's also... Uh, that, that's the impression that I'm getting, that, that that's preferred. Uh, when I wanted any more, as I'm doing some of the ensemble cast type stuff or things with multiple characters, that's where, uh, and this is, this is an upcoming book that I'm doing, that's where you kind of switch over to theme so that you can bring, comfortably bring people in and then the hook is the theme rather than trying to make the hook uh, you know, these three people. Now, it worked great for, for primates, I, I think. Again, totally biased. Uh, but they had such a close connection and, and, and sort of a, a focal point, at least in the, or those three uh, scientists, in, in their mentor, that doing Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Brute Galdikas, one of whom most people hadn't heard of much, worked out great. And maybe that's the other thing. It's probably, probably good and easy, again, from a, a publisher's point of view. And we have people who know publishing better than me in here, probably. Uh, I shouldn't even say probably. Certainly. Um, but, you know, two super famous people and, and two people who have had movies made about them and one not, 
that works pretty well. Uh, and probably I'm passing the buck a little. It's probably easier for me to, to do it that way. Uh, it's also f a lot of fun to go deep and long, <laughs> football terminology, uh, on, on one person. Uh, so, but I, I, I'm still getting to have it a little bit both ways. So like I said, the, uh, an upcoming book has a huge ensemble cast. There's no one focal point uh, of, of, as a scientist, but there's an overarching theme to it, and that uh, makes makes it easy to have that uh, have these snappy one word titles uh, that uh, I kind of like. I don't know if that's a really good answer to that question, but there's no right answer. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think it was my. Uh, can you talk uh, a little bit about your scripting process? Um, like when you, you work with different artists, I think you've never yes. worked with Gerald before. That's right. So do you do you just do your script and hand it off, or does each artist do, do, they, do they you get feedback from them and make changes that way? Uh, and and Gerald, do, do you have any insight on like how did that happen? How did you work that with with um, Jim? And do, do, have you worked with other writers as well in a different way? So well, um, for my case, I was contacted by for a second and they said, hey, we have this book by Jim Ottaviani, do you want to take a crack at it? <laughs> and they sent me some, a little bit of the script and I did some sample pages and I sent it back to them and then um, Jim got to look at them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I've done some other work with other with other writers. Um, I also write my own stuff, but um, yeah. That was gonna be one of yeah. my questions for you. If the, if the projection was totally impossible, uh, if I was going to interview you, oh, I, would, oh. I would ask how it's different working with, say, say Nick, who you, who you did a long, another long graphic novel. Yeah, with. it's it's so it's so it's so hard <laughs> to say. It's different. I mean, is it, it different in that we didn't have to pass you through a metal detector, so I knew you wouldn't come in unarmed. I, I guess that's that's part of it. I feel like um, kill me. <laughs> I feel like um, yeah. I mean. It, it, the, the style is so different. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't worked. I've done some like short um, nonfiction stuff, but I hadn't worked on a long nonfiction book mm -hmm. before. So that was like a whole different thing. I mean, it was like uh, the number of times I was reading the script and be like, what, really, that happened? <laughs> like he was doing this kind of stuff. I, you know, so I knew so little about um, the subject. So uh -huh. it was like a, a fun thing for me as an education um, to, to work with a script like this. Yeah. yeah. So, so what that script looks like is. You know, page one, panel one, uh, these people are doing these things in this setting if that matters or if it's not already implied from a previous, certainly it's not implied on page one, panel one. Uh, and uh, sometimes a little bit about mood as well. And, you know, a comic script is full of spoilers mm -hmm. for the artist, which you have to have, uh, because sometimes like, and we're going to see that a scene, we're going to see people interacting in this way again 50 pages from now. So in the second or third draft, that's when I have to do a lot of tedious work. It's like, all right, you know, I can no longer put on page X, this thing happens. I have to go find which page that happened so you can go back. So there's a, a fair amount of detail in these scripts um, that doesn't mean that that's what has to be drawn or, e or needs to be drawn. And, it, and as I think I jokingly said at the beginning, some, sometimes it turns out that Gerald will have drawn exactly what I asked for, and it was clearly the wrong thing to have asked uh, for it. Uh, as far as for a specific artist, uh, this one was not. Uh, didn't know for sure that it was going to be Gerald, but we had this idea of realistic, you know, realistic within the realm of car cartooning to very cartoony. So we knew that the person who did this had to have that dynamic range that, you know, had to be able to draw and draw across four octaves, uh, so to speak. Um, and so that colored what, what uh, for, who for a second was going to approach. And then 
as I've said, I think to Joe, I, I like to think that I would have veto power if some if an artist just like, no, oh, that is not right. Uh, I will say that in all the time that I've worked with artists, and so this is where I'm really grateful for the publisher because they have a good eye, and every time they've kind of said, "All right, we've seen a lot of samples, we've shown you some of them, but we think this is this is the one." And I've always agreed. It's like, yep, there have been strengths in everything that we've seen, but this is the one. And I don't know that there were too many, fortunately for us, because it made life easy. It's like, Gerald's, Gerald's stuff comes in, it's like, yeah. Uh, does he have a contract yet? Can, can we move this along? So yeah, it worked out really well. Uh, there and then there. I forget her name, but Einstein had this assistant uh, that was like a loyal servant for years and years, and he dubbed her Cerebus. Uh, and uh, just, uh, she Helen, du story. Helen Dukas. Yeah, because she and, um, was like got U.S. citizenship the same day as uh, Al Professor Albert and his wife. I think I think Einstein made it a condition of him coming to Princeton, uh, the Institute of, of Advanced Studies. I, this is why you write books, so you don't actually have to remember facts. <laughs> but I think this is the case, uh, that he made it a condition that Princeton would use its resources to make sure that she, uh, his, his wife Elsa, and uh, his assistant, Mike Meyer, all got citizenship at best possible speed. Uh, so yeah, she, she's definitely in the book. She has, she has stuff to say. Oh, yeah. uh, towards the end of the book. I, I liked how she was like frustrating all these researchers and biographers into the 1980s. It was, it was like, stand your ground, you know, don't go further. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's good that this is, these are the 2020s. There, there have been some bad things about the 2020s so far, uh, but li living here in the future, it means that much more source material is is available and there are fewer gatekeepers. Princeton is doing a tremendous job of making Einstein's complete correspondence available, for instance, and couldn't even begin to tell you how heavily we drew on that. I just want to say that it, it's a real pleasure to be introduced to this world and how the two of you work together and how it is to make one of these, which I knew nothing about. And oh, that's so cool. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it wasn't too far into the weeds inside baseball. <laughs> we love this stuff. Yeah. We, I mean, yeah. we, we until today we've never actually never met in person before. Oh, I mean, wow. I, I made a joke to 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 a, a fellow librarian many years ago, uh, who said, "So, so how do you communicate?" And I think this person was being a little bit snarky. It's like, "Oh, we don't talk at all." And when we talk, we talk about football. <laughs> and when we talk about football, it's basically over beers and it's mostly grunting. <laughs> um, which is not true. We we we've talked a lot. A lot. Uh, but to the inside baseball thing, even after working together for so many years, we spent I don't know how much time talking inside baseball again yeah, this afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because yeah, it's fun, yeah. and uh, I guess it, per, per that Darwin quote, that it is a simple form, but it offers you a lot of opportunities to do fun stuff. And it must be so much fun for the two of you to like actually meet. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. 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 Goose bumping here, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, and then, then. Um, I have an inside baseball question for you. Like, awesome. Kudos to like, creating that style of caption balloon that's like square just to talk directly to the audience because I Thank don't you. think I've seen that in any other graphic novel before. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it exists. Awesome. I mean, it's possible it exists someplace else, but yeah. there was a lot of trial and error to, to find that. That oh yeah. Solution because yeah. you know we were like well, we don't have to do this. And, yeah. We tried yeah. color. We tried perfectly square balloons. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. yep. Yeah. And uh, obviously you know about Scott McCloud and making comics. And yes. Yes. Comics yeah. and all of this. So like, how much did you like build on that as like a toolbox to jump from, and how much were there like problems that you came across that you had to like you know create your own solution? Uh, I mean, I feel I think that the biggest like fundamental change. In the Scott McCloud thing is using those those panel gaps as mm -hmm. a scene change. So the time jump scene change, like that was our scene to scene transition. But right. everything else was moment to moment. Right. And so that that's also something that I, I haven't really seen before. Although I do we see some people play with the yeah, spacing of 
panels. And manga does this. Do they? Okay. Uh, a little bit more than uh, Western comics. Yeah. Do. Yeah, Western comics is pretty rigid. Like, nope, the panels, the gutters are this wide. And, and, and I, I expect there will be some some comics folks who hate this idea uh, as well. There, yeah. Don't don't mess with that yeah. stuff. I think that there's a, there's a perpetual kind of wild westness to comics that like the the grammatical rules are not as set as they are in prose or yeah. in other things. Yeah. You can. You can Experiment a little bit more as long as you get the idea across, um, you can we can work with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as, as far as thinking about the, you know the various comics theorists, and Scott is not the only one uh, here, I got, I would say that it's like that book came out in the late '80s, yeah, and so it's been sitting in the background for a long time. I think it's internalized the way you have internalized grammar, in that. Uh, you, I was just reading a really fascinating book, uh, not book, uh, essay by Cormac McCarthy, of all people, on, what, it's called The Kikuli Problem, and it's, what is your subconscious doing? We are not, and as I'm talking to you, I am forming complete sentences that are grammatically correct. I am not really planning this out, though, and you don't have to do that. Uh, Four-year-olds really don't have to do that. So something else is going on, and so I think the internal. I think a lot of people who have done comics for long, long as long as say Gerald has, uh, have, have internalized the ideas, even if they haven't even read any books on, on theory, that they that there's some basic grammar rules that everybody kind of gets uh, from having just read enough comics and being exposed to them. Uh, so. All due respect to Sky, I don't think we thought about that much at all as we were writing, revising, yeah. drawing. Does, does, it, does it read? Does it flow? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. That you get, you start to get to the bigger questions like, is this going to make sense to the reader? Does the story flowing, uh, is this picture necessary? If it's not, is this panel necessary? If it's not, and that's one of the things that uh, is important on the scripting stage, don't write it because don't waste Gerald's time in drawing a panel that's not necessary. A friend, a friend of mine, Linda Medley, who did some great, great work uh, in Castle Wayne, she once looked at one of my scripts, it's very blue, <laughs> uh, once looked at one of my scripts and said, cut, 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 and then never, ever waste the pictures, Jim. Uh, and I've actually got that pasted up in my, in my <laughs> Never waste the pictures. Uh, so yeah, a, a lot of it is internalized now. But again, this is not weird. I don't think, or, or unusual or a sign of our genius. Because you're doing it every day, all the time, in communication as well. You're not thinking about grammar. You're not thinking about uh, structure. Is that, is that an adverb that I just said? Oh. Hi, yeah. So I know Gerald's are amazing drawings of exploding and uh, deliquescing machines and vehicles and kind of fantasy, you know, planets and so on. And I wonder, Jim, whether you ever would look at an artist that you now know and look at their really kind of extraordinary other work, non-comics work really, and say like, that makes me think I would like to, you know, write a book about Tesla, uh, you know, yes. for example, mm -hmm. Gerald, where, like, that sensibility about invention and machines and electricity and whatnot you know, <laughs> comes into play. Yes. Would you ever be inspired by a collaborating artist to, like, choose a subject or a way of... Oh, for sure. Like for sure. Uh, and, you know, I I think I had seen, for instance, what when pig, pig, what. Not pigs when, might fly. Pigs might fly. <laughs> I think I had seen that before uh, having, you know, proposing to work together and thought, nice stuff. I, I, I don't, I won't claim to have said, someday. <laughs> uh, I don't, that didn't happen. But one, one of the advantages for me for these two books is that Pigs Might Fly is in a fantasy version of an Edwardian era. So I was already a little bit comfortable with drawing the kind of suits and architecture right, and right, stuff right. like that, that that appears in this book in the real world. Um, so that kind of was a nice little um, segue for me from one book to the next. 
Oh, that's really, I, yeah. did, I hadn't made that connection. Yeah. But yeah, so then, then Gerald is on the radar, you know, working with Gerald, I start following Gerald's Instagram, started, start seeing, it's like, oh, I wish I could have given him some <laughs> space. <laughs> Not he, enough did, robots in did, did, <laughs> Robots and decaying spaceships in flight. That would have been really go cool because I want to see more of that. Uh, so the the short answer is yes, and the you know now having worked with you know any Gerald Maris whoever, then you start thinking what would be fun to do next, and you know as as you heard our brief interaction you know do that two hundred more times no Jim two hundred eighty more times <laughs> there there are other things that art good artists can and want to do <laughs> uh, other than be married to me. Uh, for for another started drawing in two thousand nine year year and a half yeah I'm drawing yeah. yeah yeah went longer than I thought I went over a little bit <laughs> I got the script you. I got the script and I was like oh this is this is easy to draw this is a lot of people talking and conversations and some some historical stuff and then I was like oh no there's a lot of people I have to know <laughs> exactly what they look like and I have to know exactly what burn Switzerland looks like in the 19 teens <laughs> yeah which is which is difficult to do <laughs> yeah and so when you get when you get stuck you can't just make it up yeah with these because there's always going to be somebody yeah. who who knows yeah. and this so I do some tutoring uh, at 826 Michigan which is a nonprofit uh, that promotes reading and writing largely but but they also have tutoring sessions and just like ah oh, grammar who cares I was like <laughs> Yeah, kinda, because there are there is a unfortunately there is a percentage of the population who will not know the difference if you write a bad sentence, badly constructed sentence, or a well constructed sentence. But think of it this way: write a well constructed sentence. The people who don't care and don't know won't notice, and the people who do care and do know, and there are plenty of them too, will notice. So it's win win either way. Or at least win draw. <laughs> uh, I I'm not sure that argument works great. I try I try to convince them that math is like calisthenics for their brain. Like if you if you play soccer, you don't always just play soccer. Sometimes you do sprints. Sometimes you do. do I don't think that metaphor or <laughs> thing works either. But I'll keep trying. Maybe someday. Okay, time for one one more question. Is there one more? Maybe not. Sure. Um, you mentioned you changed the airplane while I was up in the air a couple of times. Do you have any, like, is there a broad type of thing that you needed to change as it went on, or is it something you can talk about? I think, oh, yeah. I think it was mostly the, the science. Yeah. When we got into the science, there was there was things that had happened, and then we had to go, oh, this doesn't quite work. Um, and you, you said that, I, I actually enjoy that process. I actually enjoy the sort of when it's a collaborative process, and, and oh, you're, that was, you're that, thinking about drawing, uh -huh. I'm thinking about writing, and it's going back and forth, and we're, we're and I feel like that's when things gel and you get the best kind of communication. Um, yeah, when that happens. Again, I'm really, yeah. I'm really glad, ahead, because, yeah. because it felt, it felt I, I felt bad, and this is where, uh, this is why you, someone like me, wants and needs to work with a skilled, Skilled and talented. I'm going to use the two words separately because they're different, different things. Skilled and talented artist. Uh, because I thought I knew what I meant, and I thought I had the stuff right, and then Gerald would do this thing, and that now it's real, and it's not right. So now we have to rewind, try again. I think it's also a testament to how good comics is at talking about complex ideas that happen in science. Oh, that's it, a, it's such a good... That's a generous... Because, because it's yeah. you know, words and pictures together in tandem um, and can make connections that are really difficult to do in just in just words. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Good. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I think that's all the time we have. Thank yeah, you so Bonnie's giving us the sign. <laughs>